Luke 14 and verse 25. So we, uh, we're just journeying through uh, the Gospel of Luke. This is where we come to in this larger section on discipleship. The opposition that Christ faces as he marches on to Jerusalem, uh, foretelling of the opposition that his church would face. And he's speaking of what it means to be a disciple, what it's worth to be a disciple, but here the cost of being uh, a disciple. Luke 14 and verse 25. Lord, help us now as we read your word. We thank you, O Lord, for the life of Luke, for his friendship with Paul, for his acquaintance with the story of the gospel through the apostles, having spent time with others, perhaps even the mother of our Lord. We thank you for his testimony. We thank you that he was led by your Spirit to give to us an authentic account of the words of our Savior. And so let us hear and receive them this morning as the words of the living God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now great multitudes went with him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it, lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going to make war against another king, does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for land nor for the dunghill, but men throw it out. He who has ears to hear Let him hear. Amen. All right, we hear uh, a lot of the question, will you uh, be my disciple? Uh, It's a question that is uh, uh, familiar to us and loved by us. It's a question that stresses Uh, the grace and the condescension of God, his willingness and his welcome extended to all. Will you be my disciple? Uh, But this morning, uh, we're considering another question, uh, and it's one that's not so popular. People don't like it so much, and it's this. It's, can you, can you be my disciple? It's not a question that in any sense abandons the grace and condescension of God, but it is a question that stresses to us the demands that are placed upon us. If we were to be his disciples, if we are to be his disciples, if we are to continue to be his disciples. And we might not uh, like it, but nevertheless, this is the word of Christ. And I think it is foolish of us to soften it. Uh, It's foolish of us to ignore it. It's foolish of us to not take seriously what he has to say to us this morning. Just notice in verse 25, there is this enormous crowd, massive crowd that is following Jesus on the way to Jerusalem. And Jesus, on one hand, could be like, woohoo! First church of Jerusalem, booming. I'm going to be a wealthy. Uh, I'm going to. I'm going to be a wealthy, and I'm going to be a flash uh, mega pastor of the church. But he doesn't do that. Instead, he turns around to them, and he preaches one of his hardest sermons. And you could almost get the impression that Jesus doesn't want them to be his disciples. Are you willing, willing to hate father and mother? He says. Are you willing to be crucified for me? Are you willing to forsake whatever I ask of you? This is the question he puts before them, and he does so uh, for good reasons. So the question for us this morning is this. Can you really be my disciple? Can you really? Are you really? Will you really be my disciple? 
Do you understand the cost? That's Jesus' first question. Do you, do you understand the cost? Uh, we think because salvation is free, in the sense that salvation is ours through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ, that it should cost nothing. If you were to ask any of the martyrs at any time in the history of the church, they would tell you that is not the case. Salvation might indeed be free, but it might also cost you literally everything you have. For those who left father and mother, brother and sister, and were crucified, some upside down, for the cause of Christ, the life of a disciple was costly beyond everything that they could possibly pay. Jesus says to us that as with any building project, in verse 28, we should be expected to sit down and to count the cost, to ask ourselves whether we can continue in the thing that we are beginning to undertake. It's not costless to be a disciple of Christ. It might cost you a great deal. What might it cost you? Jesus says, firstly, family. Verse 26, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And at first, this is terribly distressing. If you just read it on the surface of the text, especially for somebody like me who adores my children and family, like it's unthinkable that I should hate my family. And of course, Jesus is in no sense commending hate on any level. Jesus tells us to love our enemies. Jesus tells us to honor father and mother. Jesus is here using heightened rhetoric. What Jesus is saying is that if it is not as though we hate them compared to the deep and everlasting love that we have for Christ, we cannot be his disciple. Uh, We see that kind of comparison when it talks about Jacob in the book of Genesis. Uh, He loved Rachel, but he loved Leah less. But God says he hated Leah. He loved her less. We are to prioritize Jesus above all things. You see it in the parallel text in Matthew 10, 37. Our Lord says that if anybody loves father or mother more than me, he is not worthy to be my disciple. So there is this absolute priority on our love for Christ over the love of family. And that is a live issue in the first century. Uh, If you were living at such a time as I described before with the martyrs, it just might be that you are asked to say goodbye to your family as you are put to death for the faith. Uh, As we see throughout the Gospels with the man who is blown blind and who's chucked out of the synagogue, to have an allegiance to Christ is to be abandoned by nation and perhaps even by your own family. And it is still the case in many countries of the world today. If they believe, if they are baptized into the name of Christ, uh, they may be cut off from everybody they once loved, everybody that they still love. And so then you say, well, maybe we've got it easy. Maybe we're not asked to make such choices. uh, And our lot uh, that is given to us here has fallen to us in pleasant places. And on one hand, I might say to you, well, like, that's kind of true. Like, it's not so hard. We're not going to, like, suffer a mercy killing because we begin following after Jesus. But what I would actually say is this, that it might be a bit easier for us in terms of the suffering we're asked to endure, but we are in a much more perilous and dangerous spiritual condition. The fact that we can, in our minds, have a love for Christ and not have to forsake family, uh, that very subtlety is the place where the devil dwells. Now, I've seen this many times. How do you know? If your family are not going to kick you out because of your faithfulness to Christ, how do you know that Christ comes first? And it is difficult to discern, but there are particular points and there are particular uh, activities of our lives that can reveal just that thing. I'm not having a go at anybody in this congregation, but as long as I have been a Christian, I have known, I have known Christians who will say this, I've got some special family thing going on today, so I'm not coming to church because I have to prepare the dinner. There's some family celebration, there is a birthday or something like that, so I'll not be at church on Sunday because there's this family event. What are we doing in that moment? We are in that moment saying that family trumps Jesus. And you might say I'm not, but Jesus commands his worship, and so the scriptures say you are. What about when it comes to family prayers? Some people don't even have family prayers. Some people are too busy for family prayers, and other people who have family prayers, what is the first thing that drops on a busy day? It is our personal family worship of God. 
Why should Jesus be the first one to be dropped on a busy day? Because our love is not first for Christ. The same with truth. We know family members who adopt lifestyles that are contrary to the gospel. So what do we do? We begin to abandon the speaking up of truth in love because of fear of losing that relationship. And yet in all of this, we are absolute fools. Why? Because we not only might lose our own soul in not prioritizing Christ, if you do not love me above these, you cannot be my disciple. But we risk losing theirs too. This is the beautiful thing. The love of God is not like a mathematical equation. Some people can get this wrong. Like you can imagine uh, there's some like bulky authoritarian kind of parent who wants their children to know, Oi, you, I love God, not you. <laughs> like, I love God more than you, so shut up and sit in your place and do what I tell you. That's not it at all. The love that we have is not a mathematical equation. The love that we need to love our families is one that flows from Christ. It flows from God the Father through Christ by the Spirit of the Lord, such that if He is not first, we don't have what we need to love the people that are most dear to us. If he is not first, if we do not have hold of Christ, we do not have Christ to offer to our family members. If we do not prioritize him in our lives, we risk losing not only our own souls, but the souls of the family themselves. Are you ready? Are you ready to set Jesus above family for family? Are you ready to set Jesus above family for family? What about comforts? Jesus says in verse 27, whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now, this is absolutely horrific to a first century hearer. Here is the, the method of, tor of a torturous death devised by the foreign oppressor. The Jewish people feared crucifixion above all things, and now they're coming after Jesus. Oh, we like you, Rabbi. You are wise, and we've seen what you're doing. You're healing people. We're quite excited about this. We'd like to go to Jerusalem. And he says, ah, but are you ready to be crucified for me? Now, the fact that he talks in the present tense and he says we are, have to be willing to be bearing our cross tells us that principally he is thinking here of a metaphorical cross. He is pointing here to the shame and the suffering that is associated with following after Jesus. Now, given not every Christian is persecuted every day of their lives, I actually think that the bulk of the weight of the bearing of the cross is one that is internal. It is the fight in our lives every single day for faith and hope and love within our soul. And yet it astonishes me. It is amazing that so many of us, so many of you, have these moments of honesty where you admit and you say this, it's just really hard. I'm just having a really hard time, but you say it as though you were about to turn away from Christ. But I want you to know this. It is in that very moment that you are bearing the cross. It is in the moment of doubt. It is in the moment of the anguish of your soul in psychological distress, in loneliness and isolation, that very point at which you say, I can give no more and I'm about to turn away. That is where you are bearing the cross. It is there that you have the choice to choose to continue to love Christ or forsake him. It is there that your faith is seen. It is there that the spirit of the Lord within your life is seen. It's nothing to be ashamed of and it's nothing to shrink back from. Are you ready? to be discomforted. The Lord does not promise us an easy life. He doesn't promise us a prosperous life. He doesn't promise us a comfortable life. He says that this life may involve us being discomforted. That doesn't mean that every single day that we will ever face will be all alike evil in intensity. But there will be days. There will be days in which you are sick of your life, in which you will your own death. It is just there that you are bearing the agony of the cross. It is just there that you have your choice whether you will follow him or not. If that's not enough, then possessions in verse 33. Our Lord says, So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciples. Here Jesus talks about the possessions of life, the things that sustain life, the means to those ends. He's not for a moment saying to us that every one of us is going to be impoverished, but he is asking whether we are willing to surrender whatsoever we need to surrender in the pursuit of our new cause. 
We all grow up with various aspirations and goals, things that we want to do, a good school we want to go to, a good job we want to get, a nice house, certain activities that we want to engage in. But coming after Jesus, he says, you have to be willing to reorder your priorities. There is a new priority that I lay upon you, and it's this, the great purpose of your life. And it doesn't necessarily mean forsaking everything. Other things may flow from it. But the great purpose of your life is what? It is now to know and to love the Lord, to know and to love me. And anything else, he says, will not do. If you are not willing to set above every other goal and aspiration of your life to know and to love the Lord, you cannot, you cannot be my disciple. Are you willing to let go? Are you willing to let go of whatever it is that he has asked you to let go of in pursuit of that goal, to love and to know the Lord? This is the charge that he lays upon us. If we are unwilling to love him more than family, if we are unwilling to love him more than our comfort, if we are unwilling to love him more than every possession that we might pursue, then we cannot, we cannot follow after him. He will not have us. We will not be received. This is a brutal and it is a terrible growth strategy. Jesus has a captive audience, hundreds of them who are following after him. But clearly, our Lord, and here is, uh, I think, some direction for us as a church plant. Clearly, the Lord is not in it for numbers. He is not. If he wanted numbers, he could have talked softly and sweetly and half-heartedly to the crowds, but he doesn't. He says, unless you are willing to give up everything, You cannot be my disciples, so just go away now. What the Lord asks is for total and sincere commitment to himself. The Lord doesn't want numbers. The church doesn't need numbers. The church needs a people who are totally and sincerely committed to following Jesus in every area of their life. Why? Well, Because Jesus here, secondly, foresees the carnage that will ensue if this is not the case. There is a sobering message here in this text, and it's this. It is worse to begin and not to finish than to never begin at all. Do you understand that? Jesus is saying, I would rather you never knew me than to begin and not to finish the race that is set before you. What is a half-built tower? What is this tower that he talks about, the man that is to sit down and count the cost, lest he lay the foundation and it's not finished? It is a monument to his failure. It is a monument to the dereliction of his duty and of his wisdom. It is a monument to to every, every way in which this man has not become the man that he was supposed to be. And the people, they're going to walk by and they're going to look. And everybody can see it and it's there for him to be a laughingstock. Look what this man did. He tried to build something, but he never finished. If he never tried to build the tower, they would never mock. They would never laugh. Except here's the problem, or here's the seriousness of what Jesus is saying. He's talking here of the spiritual life. He's talking here of beginning to follow after the Lord. He's talking about the things of God. And therefore, here's a question for you. If it is the case that you are half-hearted in your walk, If it is the case that you have an apostasy of the heart whilst within the body, or even an apostasy apostasy from the body itself, who is the clown in this arrangement? It is not you. I mean, yes, you are. (laughs) You would be. But who is the clown in this arrangement? It is God. It is God that is mocked. It is God who is derided by the nations when they see the weakness and the sinfulness and the folly of his church, when they see a people who had a fleeting interest but have no commitment, who were there for a while but abandoned him, it is God who appears weak. For every Christian who is not fully committed to the Lord, for every Christian who abandons the Lord, the Lord is mocked. Here is the great threat, and you can only imagine. You can only imagine the damage that this does. So the gospel can't save? So God is not in control? So the Lord is not glorious? So the Lord is not for holiness and goodness and love? What must that do to the faith of the people around you? What must that do to the potential faith of the people that we live amongst? It will crush and it will destroy it. Here is why the second illustration is used. What king is there who would go out to battle? with 10,000 men 
and not first consider whether he could defeat an on, a coming king with 20,000 men. What kind of king would do that? What kind of king would not send a delegation and seek peace with a stronger army if he didn't think he could win? Do you know what kind of king? A merciless and a foolish and a cruel king. Because what's going to happen to the 10,000 men that he takes out there? They are going to be slaughtered for nothing. And here is what Jesus is saying. For you to begin following after me, to take my name, to take my baptism to yourself, and then appear, make me to appear weak in the eyes of my people and the eyes of this world is that I will hold you to account for the slaughter of the hundreds and thousands who through your secondary causation have not come to bow down the knee to me. You made me look weak. It was your fault, Christians. We will be accountable like that foolish and merciless king for the slaughter of hundreds of souls. And so Jesus pleads, he pleads with us, if you are not ready to give all for me, then I want you to have nothing, nothing to do with me. It would be better for you never to come than not to succeed. Never to come than not to finish. Never to come than not to commit. But then there's a big problem for us because the bulk of us have been baptized and do profess faith. And so what if we are already on the battlefield? What if we've already answered this call and we're now in this like dangerous position of making a mockery of God? I do believe the Lord has us in mind here. He uses throughout here in these warnings a pres uh, the present tense, a present continuous tense. It's like this, verse 26. If anyone is coming to me, continues to come to me, and is not continuing to hate his father, mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot and he continues to not be able to be my disciple. And whoever is not continuing to bear his cross and continuing to come after me cannot be my disciple. Or again in verse 33, so likewise, whoever of you is not forsaking all that he has cannot and continues to not be able to be my disciple. Jesus is saying, you might once have committed with a certain fervency and a zeal, but if you are not continuing to prioritize me, you cannot be my disciple. He has us in mind here, and so what is his counsel to us in this situation? Well, on one hand, it is surely to press forward. It is to march on and never look back. It is to stay salty. Salt is good, he says in verse 34. This is good, that you would have a distinctive life amongst all the peoples of this earth, that you would continue to set Jesus above family and ease and everything in creation, though other men don't. This is what I desire. Press forward. Why? Because if not, you are in the sorriest and the very worst of positions. What does he say in verse 34? Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land nor for the dunghill, but men throw it out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Jesus warns us here that if we begin to lose our saltiness, we cannot be reseasoned, and we will be tossed out. What is Jesus saying? I think he's saying to us two things. First, he is pointing to the judgment that awaits those who have made a mockery of God. He points to the future judgment of those who call upon his name, who are baptized, who are members of his church, but have not consistently striven to prioritize him within their lives, who have sunken into a spirit of worldliness and not one of godliness, that when they reach the end, he says they are good for nothing but will be tossed out, just as those we've heard about in the chapters before. He will say, come, Lord, Lord, will you open the door to us? And he'll say, no, I don't know you. Depart from me. We thought we knew him, but we didn't know him. If we are not serious about this faith, if this faith is not challenging and directing and moving us each day of our lives, hear Jesus' words. You will be tossed out. You cannot appeal to Calvin to save you. You answer, oh, well, John said, John said that if I once believed, I would, I would always get into heaven. God would say, no, John didn't say that. John said you might begin. You might have the evidences of faith. You might continue for a while, and you might die 
in your sins. We cannot appeal to our Calvinism, to our doctrine, to our theology to deliver us. There is but one way to be saved, and it is through a relationship with Jesus. If our relationship is not one that is real and alive, that comes with commitment and sacrifice, we will not enter the kingdom of heaven. I think he's also saying this to us. The more that you trifle with Christ, the more dangerous your position becomes. The more that you are part of the body and you are attempting at times to read the word and you have some idea of the gospel and of Christian theology and you know God's people and sometimes you're in fellowship, sometimes you're in worship, sometimes you're not, the worse your position. The more that you hear and the more that you are unmoved by the grace and the glory of the gospel, the more deaf and numb you become. Jesus here warns us that if we know Christ's word and we do not do it, we become dead to Christ's word. I want to read to you just a little from J.C. Ryle. He says this, the necessity of counting the cost is enforced by a picture of the consequences of neglecting to do so. The man who has once made a profession of religion, but afterwards gone back from it, is like salt which has lost its savor. Such salt is comparatively useless. The truth which our Lord brings out in this place is very painful, but very useful and needful to be known. No man, be it remembered, is in so dangerous a state as he who once has known the truth and professed to love it and has afterwards fallen away from his profession and gone back to the world. Why? You can tell such a man nothing that he does not know. You can show him no doctrine that he has not heard. He has not sinned in ignorance like many. He has gone away from Christ with his eyes open. He has sinned against a known and not an unknown God. His case is well nigh desperate. All things are possible with God, and yet it is written, it is impossible for those who were once enlightened, if they shall fall away, to renew them again to repentance. There is an ultimate sense in which at the point of apostasy, I believe there is probably a point for of no return. But there is also a relative sense. The more that we resist the voice of Christ, like Pharaoh, as God pleaded with him through Moses, the harder our hearts become, the more impenetrable they are to the truth and to the call of, of, of God. You know how your body fights a disease. You get, you, you get the virus and then your body builds up an immunity and you never again get that same virus. The same is true of the life of God. The more that the life of God is in you and you resist it, the more you build up an immunity to that life. And so you can go through the rest of your life, but God will never touch again so long as you continue to resist him. What then for us as God's people? Take seriously the Lord and his words. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Let him be your priority. Whoever does not bear his cross cannot come after me, cannot be my disciple. Bear your cross. Don't allow suffering to be the reason that you turn away from God, but know that is the very opportunity for you to pursue God within your life. If you are not willing to forsake all that you have, whatever I ask of you, as you journey on to know and love me better, you cannot be my disciple. Hear the word of the living God. Hear the word of the Spirit of the Lord. Hear the word of the Son of God, the one who will welcome or reject you from his everlasting kingdom. And then what? And then what? I want to ask this question, will you be my disciple? <laughs> I began, didn't I? We like the question, will you be my disciple? We don't like the question, can you be my disciple? And you might think at this point, well, I've got a bit of a cheek to ask you this question. But see, this in the end really is the heart of it. Jesus asked the question, can you be my disciple? Because he's really asking the question, Will you, will you really be my disciple? Why does he ask for total and sincere commitment from his people? 
because he really wants a people. He asks for this wholehearted commitment because he really wants you and he wants all of you. We've all seen those relationships, the, uh, the sugar, daddy, sugar daddy and the, um, I would call it the trophy bride. You've seen that, the wealthy man who's like 60 or 70, and then he's got like some outwardly beautiful woman who's in her 20s, and they marry. And why do they marry? It's not for love. The young woman likes the idea of having whatever she wants through the finances that the man is able to give. The man likes the appearance of having the younger and beautiful bride. But somewhere along the line, they know that the marriage is empty, that their lives are empty. They long for something deeper. They long for a real marriage. They long for real love. Many Christians are like this. They are like a trophy bride to Christ. Christ is their sugar daddy. They have some superficial relationship without any commitment, believing that they will receive the benefits but it is a cold and it is a callous kind of relationship to pretend love but not to give it. Why does Christ demand our all? Because he wants a real relationship with you. He doesn't want a trophy bride. He wants a real bride. And so he asks of you every day a sincere and authentic love, greater than the love between husband and wife, greater than the love between the very best of husbands and wives. A sincere love, that's what he's seeking from you. Will you be my disciple? What is offered to us here, what is offered in the gospel, is a real relationship with God. God, the invisible one who made the heavens and the earth, who is ever present, the one in whom we live and move and have our being, offers to us, invites us into a real relationship with him. And I want you also to see here what he is calling you to in all of this difficulty. What does he ask of you? He asks, he asks for what he gave, and he calls to what he is. He asks for what he gave, and he calls to what he is. Was it not Christ who was willing to be forsaken by his own nation, and to be mocked by his own brothers, and to pierce the soul of his own mother in pursuit of God's calling? Was it not Christ who was willing to bear the literal cross, was it not he who is life and purity and love, who, not, who did not taste death and curse and hatred? Was it not he who was willing to forsake everything this world has to offer? Was it not he who went without wife, went without property, went without a pension, went without possessions, went without every earthly authority that the devil offered to him in the wilderness that he might gain all things? It was he. It is his love that he sets before you. It is his commitment that he sets before you. And this is why you love him. Why do you love Jesus? Why are you drawn? Even if you're not fully committed, why do you have some attraction to the idea of the Christ? The reason is this, because in this lousy and rotten world, he proves himself to be true and faithful and righteous and loving. He shows himself to be the one who is worth believing in. He shines as a light in the great darkness. He is the sun of our universe. That's why we are drawn to him. And you know then that this so-called burden of discipleship, you know what it really is? This great difficult task that he calls us to, this sacrificing and surrendering of ourself every single day to his, do you know what it really is, this great burden? It is the gift. It is the gift of becoming like him. This is what he is doing. The beauty of the one who draws us, calls us to be as he is. He lifts up our nature, restores us by grace that we might be as little sons and as little daughters of God. Why would we bother with all of this trouble? Why would we deny so much in the pursuit of God in our families, in our communities, in bearing our sufferings, in changing our goals? Why would we go through all of this that we might be like him? What more could you want? What more could you want in this life or in the next? That you should be better than you are. That you should be you, but the most Christ-like version of you. The Lord here asks for what he gave, and he calls us to what he is. 
why should you answer this call? Why should you continue to press on and forsake all in pursuit of this call? That you might be like him. And so the way is open. The way is open to all. You cannot be his disciple unless you are willing to let him be the priority over all things. You cannot be his disciple unless you are willing to endure suffering for him. You cannot be his disciple unless you are willing to give up the pursuits of your life for him. But he wants this. He really wants you. He really wants a relationship with you. And so he asks you, will you be my disciple? Will you begin today in faith, having counted the cost, knowing the damage the damage you will do to his name, to his church, to his people in this world if you are half-hearted in this commitment. But nevertheless, will you be his disciple? And for those who have already answered that call, maybe feeling convicted and challenged, that's okay. Ours, ours is grace. Christ is faithful. And I would just encourage you to confess Search your heart in light of the things that I've said about family, about suffering, about priority. Search your heart, but confess. Christ will forgive and then pursue. It is a difficult thing that he asks of us, but salvation is from beginning to end a work of grace. He works through us. He works naturally through us. We have to will. We have to choose. We have to want. We have to do this, but... The strength is his. The perseverance is his. The spirit who animates us is his. Just as the spirit gives you earthly life, the Holy Spirit will give you this spiritual life to answer this call that he has placed upon us. And so, let us all, let us all take up this great and high and noble calling to pursue him and to be like him. Amen.